All right, guys, welcome back to the channel and thanks for dropping by. In this session, I'm going to walk you through this Madball-inspired illustration step-by-step step using the snapshots from my working file. As Christmas will soon be upon us, I'm trying to raise a little extra cash, so if you'd like to follow along on this one, I've made the work file and a template available in my Gumroad store for just $2. I'll put a link to that in the description below. There's really nothing in the download that you'd actually need if you wanted to complete a similar project on your own, so if you just want to watch the video and learn how it was done, sweet. I'll show you everything you need to know to create your own disgusting little creature illustration. That being said, as a thank you for those making a purchase and supporting my work, I've thrown in a little something extra. Included in the download, along with the template files, is an exclusive brush kit and a few other bonus goodies I think you'll really enjoy. I'm calling this one the Quick Kit Mini. It's basically a very minimal brush kit that I made for my personal use. I've been tweaking things and making changes to it constantly for the past couple of months, and it's my go-to kit for general illustration and relaxation at the moment. It contains the same brushes that I use to sketch out, ink, and color parts of this artwork, as well as a few new brushes that I've not yet made available in any of my other kits. You'll get a glimpse of it in this video, and it's sure to show up in future sessions as well. With all that said, paying customer or not, thank you again for watching and supporting the channel. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you can learn something new. Let's get into it. All right, guys, let's jump into this. Well, I posted this on Instagram a few days ago. People seem to have really liked it. Um, and I did something a little different with this one. Um, what I did was basically, if you come down here to the history, I saved all my snapshots and then you know, uh, I should back up just a second here and say that, uh, you know, on the iPad version of Affinity Designer, as of yet, we can't name our snapshots. We can only take them. But if you are creating new snapshots on the desktop versions, you can actually name the snapshots. So what I did was after I finished this project, I went back and I took all of my snapshots and I reverted to the snapshots and then copy and pasted them and renamed them into a new document. And that's uh, how you can see sort of the progression of my work uh, as I completed this project. So I thought as a cool sort of tutorial or video, what we would do is I would go back to the very beginning and sort of discuss every moment in the creation of this guy and sort of what was going on in my head and what I was trying to accomplish and also go over all the techniques that I used to create the various parts of the illustration. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, get into it. I'm going to take a sip of this hot tea here and, uh, then we'll, uh, get going. I try to keep this one under an hour, but I, I'm, I can't make any promises. <laughs> it gets a little involved, uh, in the inking uh, process and, um, yeah, we'll see. Um, so, all right, we'll come up here, we'll select the rough sketching snapshot, and then we'll back up to it. And there's nothing there. There is, it's just all turned off. So basically these are my really, really rough ideas. And what I'll do is I'll just start by saying, this is how I sort of got started on this project. I, um, I was goofing around, you know, like I always am. And um, the other day I, I came across this. I didn't search for it. It just kind of popped up in my feed. But I realized, you know, I don't know, really caught my attention. I used to love these toys um, back in the 80s called Mad Balls um, when I was young. I was like a real little kid. And and um, I can't remember exactly what image it was. I think it was like this one. It really uh, just jumped out at me because I I remember this this eyeball here and um uh, there it's just it's just crazy what you remember anyway I I saw some of this artwork uh these these mad ball uh illustrations by this um American greetings they are uh really fun and uh just bold and uh simple and I don't know I I just uh I started thinking to myself, man, I really want to draw something like that just for fun. Yeah, like this dinosaur with a nuclear bomb in its mouth. I mean, this is crazy. 
Uh, I, I just, I remember having, it's weird how your brain kind of plays tricks on you. I don't know if I even had one of these in particular per se. My mind is trying to tell me that I had all of them, but I do remember playing with that eyeball toy. It just seemed like every kid on my block had one of those and we were always tossing them around, trying to play it like, you know, wiffle ball with them or whatever. And uh, yeah, it was just, I don't know. Anyway, this flood of memories came back. I saw some of this artwork. Like this, this is pretty, pretty rad right here. Um, I saw some of this stuff and I just thought, man, I really want to sort of take my own crack at it. All right. So that's where we started. And then what I did was uh, first I opened up the stock studio and I and I pulled in a reference from Pixabay of a sphere with a texture on it. Just to sort of give myself like a, I don't know, kind of a map to create this ball. And uh, I started collecting my thoughts and some rough notes. You can see here over on the right, um, I've got uh, Cyclops, Zombie, Pirate, Bear, Bebop. I guess it's Bebop from the Ninja Turtles. And then um, what is this? Chains, Slime, Spikes, Teeth. And what's this last one? Brains. Yeah. And then over on the left, I, I tried to narrow it down. I was like, okay, Alien, Zombie, Brain, Tube, Cyborg. So that's sort of where I was. That was like my main plan, alien, zombie, brain tube, cyborg. So that's where we went with that. After I got that worked up, what I did was uh, you, you see here um, on the screen, this is the sort of the T line in between the eyes, right? And then I worked up my initial sketch from there. Yeah, and it's really rough. Um, I did this sort of, you know, uh, in between classes, I would just like, pop on the old iPad and just rough out what I was trying to get out of my head. Um, I added a little more with some, uh, with a red layout pencil. Uh, and then finally what I did was, uh, before I left that day, uh, I just tried to get a really clean version of that sketch down. And it's, 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 pretty awful and you know i i realized there's a lot of problems with it um here uh this brain it's like i realized at this moment i was like man i do not know how to draw a brain this thing looks like a cauliflower or a broccoli or a cabbage or something it doesn't really look like a brain so there's that um but other than that i felt like the concept was really solid and then i was like okay i really need to refine this and make it into a nice drawing and so if we go to, back to the history uh studio We'll go to our final sketch. This was the final sketch. And um, yeah, you can see it, it matches up pretty well with uh, my original sketch. But I I, I basically, um, I went back into Pinterest. Pinterest is invaluable, especially if you're working on your iPad. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you really, occasionally I will bring in, uh, um, I will bring in um, like a, Let's do 3D brain on that one. Um, let me initialize my keyboard here. Um, occasionally, I will bring an image into Affinity Designer if I'm looking to, you know, sort of snap up the colors from it or something like that. But uh, very rarely do I ever really need to do that because most of the time what I'm just looking for is like, you know, I need... I like a reference and I'm pretty sure I used this guy right here to draw this brain uh, and sort of get that in. And I really felt happy with the end result that I got from my brain. And you can see here um, what I did was um, I started with this. It was just a clean sketch. I marked out my spot blacks with X's. Yeah. Uh, except for the nostrils and the ear there, but um then, you know, I went back in and I was like, hey, you know, he needs a little bit of goop on the tongue, like flying off, you know, and then I got uh, some details on my jar there. I didn't want it to appear too clean, you know. So, yeah, that's the uh, that's the sketching phase. Um, I want to just show you here what I did was uh, I sketched this with a blue layout pencil, but uh, occasionally, you know, the blue line tends to aggravate me somehow. I don't know. I just don't it just depends on what what's happening you know um i knew that i wanted to get some textured paper as i always do into this project so what i did was i was like okay i'm going to tone down that blue a little bit 
Um, this is really useful for line work, especially if you've got black line work and you need it to be like a different color, maybe like not so black black, like a dark maroon or something. You can come in here and throw a cover color overlay on, on it and it will change the uh, color. Oh, I guess I did do that final sketch in black. I, I think, uh, yeah, okay. So, right, because it, it were, it, it's like this. This one was done in, with blue line, right? And then I went back over it with black, but the black was a little harsh, and I knew that I was going to ink, and I didn't want to ink black on black. So to change the color again, I just went in here to the color overlay, and uh, you set your color in here, um, whatever you want it to be. Non-photo blue is somewhere around... Something like this. Yeah. Something like this. And, um, yeah. You can do it that way if you want. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a really useful tool, this color overlay effect. So basically, I, I changed the color to prep for my inking phase. And that's where we'll move to next. <laughs> All right, so here um, you can see uh, right away, I, I imported a paper texture. Uh, that was a real easy thing to accomplish. Uh, basically, um, I knew that I wanted this thing to sort of represent the nostalgia that I was kind of feeling from, you know, when I was looking at the the old ratty, you know, uh, comic book advertisements. And I just started remembering like um, when I was young, I used to love going to Toys R Us. Um, it was actually pretty close to our uh, neighborhood. And, um, you know, it was just fun to walk up there and uh, go, you know, exploring through the Toys R Us aisles. Probably spent way too much time in there as a kid. Uh, arrested development, if you will. But, um, yeah, anyway, I wanted to get that sort of uh, look like this thing was up, uh, you know, printed onto the side of like a cardboard box or some kind of like, you know, like they used to have uh, these mad balls. They would come in these little cardboard boxes or, or car they would come in these little nets that had like cardboard tags attached to them. Anyway, yeah, uh, I wanted it to look like that. So basically, what I did was I, I went in here and uh, we'll just turn this off. And I'll actually grab all these and turn them off for a minute. Um, you go to the stock studio. I searched for paper texture. They don't have a, a, the 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 Pixabay and the Pexels. They they've got a they've got quite a few paper textures, but you're not going to find any kind of sort of high quality scans or anything in here. They're all some of them are some of them are large, but for the most part, they're 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 not two high dpi scans or photographs of paper but they, they'll they'll work uh you know occasionally you'll get you'll get one that has a really great texture i think it was this one that i pulled in so you just you just tap it hold it drag it in you'll download it from pexels or this was pixabay rather whoa what happened to it did i even get it in the here i'm gonna undo that let's see all right, am I going crazy? Oh, okay, so I see what's happened. It's, uh, I put it inside the uh, the layer there. Sorry about that. Okay, cool. So once it's in the project, I've got it in here. And see, what I saw in this texture that I really liked were these lines, right? Uh, you can see there's like these striations that are going across the, the texture. I really wanted that. Uh, I really just, I don't know, it felt good to my eyes. So I basically came in here. And what I tried to do was I tried to get them running parallel with the actual artboard or the canvas. So I just made some adjustments with the move tool, rotating the handle, you know, till I got those things looking as parallel as I could possibly get them, you know, and I, and I eyeballed it. I didn't do it like exactly, but that looked about right. Once you get, once you start, once you've, once I got the lines lined up, I, I just sort of tried to find like a composition of the, the filthy, cardboard that I liked and then once that was in place what you do is you just come up here and you rasterize and trim and it'll trim it to the size of the spread 
right? And then you lock it into place. Uh, th this will come into play a little bit later as we uh, move forward, but that's basically how the texture got into the project. So let's uh, turn it back on and then start talking about uh, the journey that I was taking here. Oops, sorry. So uh, I saved a snapshot at this stage and basically what I have started here is basically like, I'm trying to form the outlines of the major forms of this piece, right? Um, I started, uh, everything stacks up, right? So every time you add a layer, like if I add a vector layer, it always goes up above the layer that I previously worked on. So from the bottom to the top, you can see exactly the order which I sort of drew this all out in, um, oops. So I started with the eyes, right? Moved to the nose, moved up to the chrome dome, to the brain bowl, and then the ear outline. And then I thought, you know, this was, I made some good progress. I decided to take a snapshot at this stage. Let's go back over each little area, uh, one stroke at a time. And I, well, not one stroke at a time, just sort of, um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the concept uh, and the technique that I used for these uh, little parts of the illustration. Um, this uh, illustration is not as similar to the Cypha Secrets in that I didn't use the pen tool very heavily on this one, uh, or the, I'm sorry, or the brush tool. Um, there are benefits and drawbacks to using the brush tool. And for me, the main benefit of the brush tool is that you can use preset brushes that have a specific settings in them. And you can also use textured image brushes uh, with your vector curves, right? That's the main attraction of using the brush tool. You can paint out these textured image uh, brush strokes. But when it comes to drawing cursive lines with great accuracy and simplicity, the pencil tool is the king. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the eyeball here and we'll just look at the sketch for a minute. Look at this sketch for a minute. Unlike Cypher from Cypher Secrets with like these tightly angled, her, her tightly angled chin line, you know, um, her neck and uh, the very uh, precisely drawn sort of cloak hood that we had on that drawing, um, those were, those lines were really well suited to the pen, pen tool. But in this case, we've got what uh, a lot of inkers refer to as a lot of cursive lines. And those are lines that taper into one another, into and out of one another. Um, there's a great book on comic book inking called Comic Book Inking, or I think it's called The Art of Comic Book Inking. Um, it's by an artist named Gary Martin. And I think also it's co-authored by Steve Rude. Um, that is the book that you want to take a look at if you're new to the whole concept of inking. If you if you start to get into it and you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend picking up that book. Um, I'm not sure what it goes for these days. Uh, it's a really old book. It's been around for a long time, but um, it's pretty epic. And in there, uh, they'll tell you all about the different ways of approaching different types of lines and what kind of practice you need to do, things like that. Anyway, Back to this, uh, cursive lines. Why is the brush tool inferior for this sort of situation? Well, the problem comes from actually us ourselves. If I'm just gonna add another vector layer so I can ink a little bit. I'm gonna grab a brush, um, just one of my solid brushes. All right, let's see. I'm gonna draw a test line out just to see. Okay, cool. Now. The problem with the brush tool is that I cannot preset the pressure curve. And so what that means is I have to rely on my own pressure input. But as you may have seen in some of my previous videos or just even experienced your, yourself, I'm gonna really drop this stabilizer down a little bit so it's not so crazy. My pressure, the way that my hand inputs pressure is not always very precise. If I switch over to the move tool, 
Oh man, I've got to um guys, hold on. What I want to do is uh before we get any further into this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually go out to the settings and turn on show touches. Okay, cool. So we can go back. Um let me re-put that. Okay, cool. So now, okay, cool, great. Now you can see what I'm doing. Um, sorry about that. All right, so we're in here. And look at my pressure curve. It's not terrible, right? But it's overly complicated. It doesn't need to be this way. And um, also, you know, these days, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's a little bit of a bug in the uh, iPad versions of the app. Something with the Apple Pencil and iOS 15, it's causing like these weird anomalies to pop up on the initial input of strokes. So the, the devs went in and they locked the, the initial input at 20% to compensate for this. It's a workaround and they're, uh, they're saying that um, it'll actually be resolved fairly so soon. I don't, I don't know exactly when, but it's, uh, it's not ideal for drawing like these really finely tapered strokes. Uh, so there's that plus, you know, like I said, the input data is, it can, it can get too much sometimes, right? No matter how delicately you draw the line. That's where the pencil tool really shines, okay? So before I move on, I just want to recap really quick. What are the negatives? The negatives are I cannot preset the pressure data with the brush tool, okay? That's the first thing. Second thing is my pressure data gets a little too wacky sometimes. The third thing is the... The inputs, you know, you're going to always have to edit because the input values are always going to be a little bit off from what you're really looking for, right? So, see, that's there's nothing wrong with this line. It looks pretty good, actually, but the problem is, is it took me a long time to get to this, relatively speaking. So if I go back and just get rid of this, let's see how this works with the pencil tool. Um, I didn't demonstrate this in the Cypher Secrets video simply because in that situation, uh, it wasn't really necessary. There weren't a lot of moments when I might have used it. In fact, actually, there were, you know, I, I feel I feel bad. I, I could have probably used it a lot in, like when I was doing the eyebrows and stuff like that. But yeah, uh, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Let's get into this illustration and, and, and see how the pencil tool really shines. It's like, I come up here, um, I'm going to set my stroke color to black, and I'm going to give myself, uh, what I'll do is I'll give myself a nice, like just a, like a sort of a, a hill type curve, and then draw a test line. Notice down here, if you'll notice down here, I haven't set my controller uh, at all and you don't need to because I can preset everything here and this is the extent of the complications that I'll have for my pencil tool so right now I'm going to draw this line super thin because my my value is set to 0 0.1 points right but if I just drag this up a little bit 3.4 seems 3.4 seems um, reasonable. Let's just uh, let's just go to three and call it a day, right? So check it out. You know, I can before each stroke, I can edit this the way I need to, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this, and then we'll come in here. I've got my stabilizer set to about 15, right? That should work pretty well. And then let's go. I'm going to draw out this cursive stroke so you can see what it looks like when you draw it out. What's great about doing things this way is that I can concentrate on tracing the line, right? I don't have to concentrate on, uh, I don't have to concentrate or even care about the pressure that I'm exerting because the Stroke Studio's pressure curve is sort of taking precedence over that. And that's it. Once I've got my curve drawn, I can come in here and a lot of times the only thing I'll need to really clean up is just the position of some of my nodes. A two finger press and hold will give you sort of momentary access or temporary access rather 
to the, um, you know, like a sort of an edit mode. It's like toggling in edit mode. Let's see. I think we need to get rid of that node. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, oops. You'll have to get used to it. Uh, you, you, if you, you know, right when I first get started, usually what I end up doing is I'll always, I end up, you know, accidentally tapping on the screen a lot and sort of uh, creating uh, nodes uh, and starting new lines when I don't really want to. And then, it, you know, it gets, it gets a, in, it can get a little bit aggravating at first, but um, yeah, once you get the hang of it, it actually ma makes things go really quickly. So I, I've just, I would, I would normally not even spend this much time at this moment. I would just really sort of get a few lines drawn. I like to, to sort of edit in swaths, you know, like I'll, I'll draw out like four or five lines and then I'll, I'll go back and I'll edit them and make them look good. Um, so from here, while the line is selected, you know, you can sort of manipulate the pressure curve very easily and cleanly. And that's the huge benefit of working this way. If, if the line's not thick enough, thicken it up a little bit. And that's another great thing about working this way. When I go back, if I need the lines to be thicker, I can adjust them really quickly without worrying about how my pressure curve is affecting that transformation. So I'm just going to draw a few more so you can get the, get a feel for what it looks like. So here I've tapped my X twice and deselected, and I want to do this before I draw each individual line. I'm going to bring the uh, pressure curve up on that a little bit because I don't want it to taper. I want it to sort of butt into the end there. There we go. That's uh, there. Now, here, if I take this, I'll just pull it out a little bit right here. Sometimes this is good. Uh, sometimes this is bad, having this uh, blunt round cap. I can put a flat cap on this where it ends right at the, uh, the end of the stroke and then just put that back there. That'll prevent some weird... That usually prevents some weird little little like sort of round edge from protruding on either side of the line. It keeps it really clean. You can really get in here and manipulate your strokes and make sure that they um they look nice and clean. My next stroke, I don't want it to be fully tapered, but it does get a little heavier near the end there. Just come in. Like this. Got a little bit off the base uh, baseline there um, for a minute. I'm just going to take a couple of these. In fact, I'll get rid of both of those. Just come in here and then we'll manipulate this stroke. Here's another cool thing. So basically, let me, let me back up. Two finger press and hold allows you to gain access to the node and also to the handle, right? But then once you've got a hold of the handle, you can let go. And it's almost as if you've got like a one finger press and hold going, or if you're holding, um, I believe it's a command on the desktop. I'm, I'm, I've got to uh, really start getting into memorizing all my desktop stuff. But yeah, once you've got hold of it, you don't need to hold your fingers anymore. And in fact, you can begin to implement new presses. You see how I've got a two finger press here and then a three finger, right? So here, this would only uh, really be affecting it if it was like a, if it had two uh, curves coming into it. But yeah, basically, once you've got a hold of the handle, you no longer have to keep your finger pressed on the screen unless it's helping you to control it like this, like snapping to 15 degree increments. So yeah, two finger press and hold. Um, really, really useful for getting in here and doing quick edits to your curve. Um, let's see. Deselect that one. Select this one. It seems that, um, yeah. There we go. Nice. All right. Cool. XX and then continue. And guys, for much of this, 
piece, if you if we zoom out in just a moment and take a look at like everything that's gone on in the piece, you'll see that that's all there really was to it. Um, let's see what this, yeah, it's, it's fatter near the end, that one is. Cool. XX, get out of here. All right, so that's basically it. Uh, look at all the cursive lines in this piece. I, I I was really trying to just draw out this like gross looking like crumply folded cruddy skin looking zombie guy and uh, the pencil tool makes really quick work of those situations um the pressure curves are super clean you never have to worry that you're gonna have to come in here and uh, you never have to worry about coming in here and uh having to deal with this really broken pressure curve that's all over the place and then resetting it and 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 putting new stuff you you make each choice before you lay down the curve and you don't have to rely on you know the the really delicate tango between your own pressure inputs and the way that the iPad is um sort of uh recording them recording those pressure inputs the last little thing i want to talk about really quickly while we um while we're here at this moment is this um, it's a, it's a computational thing and it's really, it's really useful to, to have sort of in the, in your mind while you're doing this kind of work. Um, I'll grab my pencil tool and then, um, let's talk about this, this first line again, we can go back and we can talk a little bit about this. Now check this out. Look at all these, uh, nodes here. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 nodes here. Okay, I'm gonna delete this really quick and I'm gonna go back and draw it again. We're gonna do a little uh, little sort of experiment. I think I may have talked about this in the Cypher Secrets video, but I may have not. I'm zoomed in super close, right? And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw out this line, but what I wanna get you to understand is that look at the distance between this point, oops, sorry. Actually, this point here and this point here, okay? On my iPad, that's a relatively large um, distance, right? So what that means is every time I dra draw out a, uh, every time I draw out a stroke, there's gonna be more data points in between, which means more nodes, right? So if you're looking to keep your lines simple, doing it is not always easy. Check this out, let's try. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 that time, right? Because I was zoomed in so close. Now let's take a look if I zoom out. Now look at the distance between here and here. It's very small relatively compared to the screen of my iPad. And if I draw out that stroke again at this zoom level, let's get it over here so I can get my hand in here. Zoom out just a little bit more, about like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It significantly cuts down on the number of nodes just by cutting down on the distance between two points in the line. Yeah, so that's uh, a super useful sort of thing to have in your uh, toolkit mentally uh, when you go into this kind of thing. If you want to keep your lines ultra simple and really well conceived, zoom out while you ink and zoom in while you edit. Um, Look at how much more quickly I, I'm able to sort of deal with this line simply based on the idea that there are fewer nodes here. There are fewer things to get hung up on, fewer things I've got to move around. And then again, like I've said many times in the past on se uh, several other videos, it's much easier to add what you need than it is to go hunting for the things you don't need that are sort of mucking up the works and then deleting them. So yeah, 
uh, reduce the distance on your screen and you'll reduce the number of nodes that you draw when you draw the lines. So that's my little um, cursive line pen tool spiel. Uh, I got in there and uh, went for it with the old uh, pencil tool. Um, of course, you can also get in here and do uh, work with the line tool as well. Um, something like this little, these little dark areas here, the pens line mode, you grab the pen tool, throw it into line mode. Again, just like, just like um, the pencil tool, you can preload the, the, the stroke preset, right? So you can preload that and then um, I've started at the fat end and I've brought it down to the tapered end and I've just got one little note in there in case I want to uh, play with it a little bit. But basically you just come in here, draw the line out and then we've got this comfy little edit mode that we can use uh, as we're uh, dealing with that. Um, you know, I've talked many times about overlaps in several other videos. Uh, in this situation, with this little with this little guy, uh, man, that's a really tough little situation, right? Because it's like, what do I do? Do I do do I really want to edit the taper? I don't think so. What I would do with this little situation is I would just expand that stroke, and then go in, add a couple of nodes, and be done with it, right? This is not going to make or break the piece, and I can always come back and edit that and get it just right, or maybe do it with a different style, or maybe just kind of, you know, uh, the advantage of inking my own artwork is that I don't have to to, to strictly adhere to some lines that have been thrown down, um, and I'm not going to get into my any kind of arguments uh, with like you know my penciler because it's me. Um, but yeah. So you can deal with uh, a lot of the little situations with the pen tool in line mode. Um, the eye here, uh, I've gone in and basically done that with an ellipse. I duplicated it, shrank it down. Um, yeah. So it was like, I took this, duplicated, three finger press and hold, shrank it down, come up here, swipe over, right? And then what I... I duplicate this one, oops, sorry, duplicated this stroke, uh, shape, change the fill color to that red, right? And then once, once I had the fill color turned to red, that just lets me know mentally that this is going to be, uh, put into erase mode. And that helps me get sort of an idea about what this thing's going to look like once I, uh, you know, draw a specular in there. You don't have to do that, but it's the beginning of be getting used to sort of hiding things that you don't want to be seen or that you that are not necessary to uh, for the image to be read. Um, so, right. Uh, basically, I, I, I started working through my outlines. I got my nose done in much the same way. That's all pencil tool there. Yeah. And then the chrome dome situation, that's a, that's a pen tool job. Um, if you look at that line, I wanted that nice bold outline there. Four nodes. I went in, just precision edited it with the pen tool. It looked something like this. Once I, once I put it down, it was like, uh, I'll grab the pen tool. Uh, with the pen tool, you can preload the line. Um, occasionally I will. Sometimes I don't need to. Come in here, switch it back over. Um, let's, uh, it's, it's, it's blunt on both ends. It's not terribly, there, there is going to be some editing here, but I'll leave it like that for right now. One, two, three, and four. Oops. I'm still in line mode. Sorry guys. One, two, three, and four. Yeah. And we'll just go in here, switch over to the node tool. Oops, yeah. grab this stuff and get to work on it. And in fact, this kind of goes down like this, right? Just a little bit, it's weird. Pulling on the segment, actually the, the placement of your, the placement of your 
pencil, when you're pulling on the segment, like if I pull on the segment here, it gives me these nice long handles, right? But if I pull on the segment closer to the node, I, I get to sort of adjust the length of the handle in relative to the position of the node. And that can be super useful and help you edit really quickly, just keeping that in mind. So it's like, it's very intuitive. I love the way that they programmed it. Here, right, we've got one, two, three, four nodes. So I know that this thing can be divided. Mentally, I can divide my pressure curve into fourths uh, horizontally, right? So it's like, I know I want this little area to be a little bit thinner and I want these areas to be a little bit thicker. Maybe this area to get, to regain its thickness. Something like this. And the whole reason I want to do it that way is because I want to accentuate this sort of sharp edge. And that's another thing we can talk about um, here. I've got this nice, I've got this sort of rounded edge. Oops. I've got this rounded edge that I don't want. So what I want to do is I just come in here and I switch to the miter joint type. But then my, my joint is looking kind of chiseled off. I just increase the miter limit to get that back. You don't have to go crazy with this. In fact, if you go crazy with this, sometimes it's really bad. Um, it can be really aggravating while you're editing the lines. But uh, yeah, when you switch to the miter joint, and the miter disappears, just increase the miter limit. And there you go. So yeah, that whole side of the head right there was done with the, with the pen tool, basically. Okay, let's see, where is that? All right. Not that any of this matters. This is another great thing about working this way. Uh, I feel like this is the way I'm gonna try to do some tutorials from now into the future because it it's really convenient, you know, like being able to go back in time and 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 sort of take a look at every step that that was taken. Um, up here on the brain bowl, uh, basically, again, this was a well, this is a pen tool job, and you can see that clearly just by looking at the quality of the lines or just the 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 way the lines are um here you know you've got these really uh hard angles and then you've got these nice swooping curves that was all pen tool stuff um the thing to take note of here is the way that i went about erasing the parts of the line uh this line right um basically as this is on a layer when you put something into erase mode the erasure doesn't affect anything outside the layer, right? So I'm just switching over to this so you can see what it looks like. So basically I went in with the pen tool. I drew out these shapes the way I wanted them to appear. I I, 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 I put this line here like this so it, so it would appear that, you know, the, the, the sort of the line would go underneath the little uh, brain bowl uh clamps i guess you would call them like yeah clamps that are securing it to the the brain so it would look as though the clamps were sort of clamping down on that rim there um but yeah basically i drew those red shapes out with the pen tool put them into erase mode and that took care of the line situation so yeah the brain bowl pen tool job and then back over to the ear Got a bunch more of the cursive line drawn uh, with the old uh, pencil tool. And just look at it. That line is crazy, right? But uh, my pressure curve, it, it wasn't originally this crazy. I put all those nodes in there. I started with a simple three node pressure curve, but I put all those in there to sort of give it character. And what was great about it is I didn't have to, This this shape would never have come out of me physically uh, with a brush tool, yeah? Sometimes getting that pencil tool in there and then making those edits is the best way to go about it, sometimes. Um, so yeah, that is this phase of the process, guys. Um, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's carry on, let's, let's move forward. Um, we'll go to the snapshots. All right, we'll go to inking continued. Okay, here, I'm just continuing. There's nothing really special that I'm gonna show you in this little section. Um, 
The teeth, those are pen tool jobs. If we just take a look at them really quick. And again, you can see after I, I stopped at the ear, I started with the teeth, started with the upper lips. The main thing I was trying to do is, uh, what I'm starting to do is I'm starting to think about what I'm gonna do in the coloring phase. So what, what I need is, um, let me back up. I decided mentally before I started this that I was gonna try to color this one with my raster tools in Pixel Persona, which I don't do often, but I wanted to get more practice with them. So I colored this thing in Pixel Persona. Um, I wanted to master the art of the flood fill and uh, that can get aggravating sometimes, but I think I've got it under control now. And I'll tell you all about it when we get to the coloring phase. Basically, um, I'm trying to set this thing up so that I can easily corral my flood fills. Yeah. I want to make sure that my ink outlines are nice and solid and they're all contiguous. I've got these nice little areas that I can come in and sort of dump uh, color fills into without worrying about them spilling over into other areas of the illustration. So uh, that's where my focus was. I was trying to make sure that I really inked this thing super cleanly. The only difference, uh, uh, you know, the only thing special that I might have done here was on these teeth, I drew them out really quickly with the pen tool and uh, used the no tool to sort of break them and edit them the way that I need them to be. So if you look at the pressure curve on this, it's a little wacky, but again, it didn't start out that way. I did that on purpose. Let's uh, draw another tooth in here so that you can see how that works. I basically went in here. I'm actually going to reset this pressure curve, bring the inputs down pretty low. 3.7 is fine. I will go in here and hit it at, um, let's do one, two, three, and then close it up. Switch over to the node tool. And then from here, I'm just starting to sort of edit and get what I need. Yeah. This is a particularly wonky little shape that I drew here. So it took a little, uh, took a little messing with. So that's the basic shape of the tooth, right? And it's starting to get a little weird, right? I can't see underneath it anymore. So when that happens, just come in here to your color studio and just momentarily drop the opacity on the fill of the stroke. And that way you can see what you're doing. I come in here, I'm adding some more nodes, right? And in fact, in this situation, what I want to do is I come in here and I uh, break this one like this and then take it. Then what I'm trying to do is right I'm starting to sort of form the the edges of my uh, outline here you see I'm not actually going to use the fill tool on this curve. I'm inking now. I don't, I'm not treating this as a curve per se. Um, I, to me, I'm only thinking about what, what the ink lines look are going to look like at the end of the, at the end of the day. And here I know I, I want this to taper fully, right? But it needs to come up a little bit so I can get, get in here and get some, things done. I'm sharpening up these nodes because it's much easier to sort of deal with like drawing sort of cracked lines and things like that. Uh, cracks don't usually happen smoothly. They're, they're like, you know, especially in cartoon world. Um, yeah. And then here again, this is a situation where we can increase the miter limit to get that shape that we want. So something like this. And in fact, what I'm going to actually do is I'll probably, 
I wouldn't normally do it. Um, sometimes I would try to avoid it, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually break this here and then we'll, we'll, we'll make both ends of this one tapered. Yeah. I'll get rid of this node. And then for this line, remember these are two lines. They used to have identical strokes, uh, stroke, uh, pressure curves, right? But now I'm going to take this second line here because they're both selected. I'm going to take the second line and start adjusting the curve on that one to where it's like this. Yeah, however the shape is. But this is essentially how I got the teeth drawn in. A little bit too thick the line is. I'll bring the pressure curve down so it kind of tapers up. All right, and then once I'm done with that, I just select them again, go back to the color studio, bring the opacity back up to black, and there you go. So that's uh, how I got the teeth in there, okay? Uh, other than that, nothing really special happening at this moment. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on, we'll go move forward. All right, this is a pretty important stage. Um, Basically, again, uh, I haven't used any new techniques that I haven't showed you here. Um, everything was done with the pencil tool or the pen tool. And uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm pretty sure at this stage that I've got all my color corrals in place. And so before um, going on to the details and the coloring, um, I basically made sure that this thing was a fully enclosed outline, right? If I wanted to dump just one color into this thing, I could. In fact, I'll just go ahead and show you. No, you know what? I'm not gonna show you that right now. I'll, I'll wait until we get to the coloring phase. But basically that's what's happening here. If you notice, um, also what I'm also trying to do is, uh, let's let's jump back and forth real quick. I'm gonna go back from, from this one Look at the eye specifically. Uh, specifically, I want you to focus on, oops. I want you to focus on, um, ah. I, I want to, there we go. I just needed a, I want you to focus on the eye area here, okay? Focus on this area here. Look what it looked like at this stage. The lines are much thinner, right? Um. Basically, if I go back to the stage, look how I've thickened them all up. I just went back and I wanted them to be bolder. I, there's two reasons for it. It's just basically I'm trying to make the form readable. I want the basic form of this creature to be readable, right? Before I start sticking in all the details, when I start sticking in all the details, things could get muddy if you're if the line weights the line weights are not correct. So um that's what I was trying to do here. I went in and basically, you know, at this stage, it makes it really easy having everything on these layers like this and they're nicely labeled. You know, every time I finish a little area, I'll label it. Um, I come in here and um, for this group here, you know, I just selected the lines that I wanted to select. Uh, they're all sort of in the same family and it's not a real huge deal, you know, about... Uh, taking this and sort of adjusting the size of the pressure curve. And if you if you go and you look at this, the weight is the same for all these lines, but because the pressure curves are different for each line based on how I edited the curve, it uh, it still works. It, it it's uh, they feel the lines don't feel terribly um, you know, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? They don't feel that they are like cookie cutter stamped into the drawing. They have their own little personalities and uh, they feel independent of one another, but they work together. And that's what I was trying to get going with this, especially with these lip areas over here. Uh, they're falling on the outside of the picture, right? And this is sort of a graphic design rather than a comic book illustration. I still I wanted the weight to be heavier on the outside of the drawing. 
So that's what I was sort of busying myself with at this stage in the game. All right. So after that, I go and I move on to my spot blacks. Um, these were mostly done with the uh, the pencil tool and the pen tool. Um, for example, down here, oh, and, and by the way, when I did my spot blacks, I basically went in here and brought my layer underneath all the other ink layers. I'm, I'm sort of treating them as though they're color layers, right? So I brought them down here and uh, yeah, I just went to town. A uh, little pencil tool job, pencil tool. Um, let's see, over here, this little area right here. Definitely a pencil tool job. Now this job can get a little complex. For this one, you'll you'll want to uh, take advantage of sculpt mode. I'm going to grab my pencil tool, and we'll set it up for this fill situation. I've got the fill set already. Luckily, the stroke is set to null, which is good. Uh, if I turn on sculpt mode here, like this, just tap it. Basically, it allows me to get in here and sort of draw one stroke at a time. Now right away. Sometimes the old uh, setting will sort of repopulate. In fact, while I'm drawing, I'm just gonna reset the pressure. So that way this thing has a null value and there's no pressure attached to it. So basically when I've got sculpt mode turned on, I can just come in and sort of get this shape drawn sort of one stroke at a time. Problem starts to arise when you have the fill enabled all right away. Sometimes you need to just turn it off. And so I'm going to get in here and turn it off and keep it off. And when I get done drawing this line, I can just turn it back on. And that's how you take care of all those black areas. Yeah, these were done with the pencil tool. And uh, yeah, that's it. So we went in and we got the spot blacks taken care of. I feel the image is readable. I can tell where the eyes are, where the nose is, where the teeth and the lips are. And uh, the brain bowl is looking really nice and solid. And so then from this stage, I get back in and I start adding details. Um, for this phase, I used pixel brushes and there's a reason for it. And it's basically this. Um, let's zoom in so I can sort of explain it. I, I talked about it a little bit in Cypher Secrets. Now we're in vector view. Right away, you'll probably be able to tell that this little area here, these lines were, the outlines were drawn with vector brushes, right? And the uh, detail lines were drawn with pixel brushes. But watch what happens when I go to my uh, navigator studio and then put this whole thing into pixels view. It's a different story, right? You have a harder time discerning which lines are drawn with a, with a raster brush and which ones are drawn with a vector brush. And uh, yeah, they, um, they work together nicely. They look really nice. They're, they're not uh, overly pixelated. It's, uh, this is possible because the setting of this document is 600 DPI. I set it really high because I started thinking about it and I knew that what I wanted to do was at the end of the day, this was going to end up on a t-shirt or a sticker or something like that. So I wanted to make sure that I was able to get a nice quality image out of this uh, when I go to print it. So I set the 
the uh, the DPI as high as I could, 600. And um, yeah, that made sure that these lines, when this thing gets rasterized, they will be as clean as possible uh, yeah, for this image. So again, uh, we're in 600 DPI. And what I did was I added a layer and I went in, and these are all pixel layers, and uh, used my uh, basic brushes. Um, I've got, yeah, I made my own versions of these brushes, but they're not much different. Um, if you go into the settings of the brushes, uh, the spacing on these basic rounds inside of uh, you know, the, the, the default basic brushes of Affinity Designer, the spacing is at 25%. Um, I'm not sure exactly why the, they, they did that. Like it's, uh, it actually, I don't know. I, I, I can't say either way. I haven't done enough experimentation with it to, to know why they chose 25% as the spacing. I, I suspect it might be because it's too tight if you go lower and maybe it causes greater pixelation in the line. I'm not really sure. But for me, um, I, I liked the result that I got when I set mine to 1% spacing. And you may notice that these basic rounds are not, uh, I don't have any um, size dynamics programmed into them. And that is because uh, I use the force pressure feature um, the force pressure feature is really great, um, especially for these basic round type brushes. Um, if I go in here, I'm just going to turn this off for a minute and I'll add another vector layer. I'll add another pixel layer and then we'll uh, start to ink a little bit and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, I grab my round and then I just turn on force pressure. Force pressure is great. Uh, it basically forces the pressure curve that you've got. Oops, I need to get some black in there. Um, it forces you, uh, it forces the pressure curve that's uh, assigned to the brush, right? So I can turn this off if I need to, you know, like if I needed to draw some sort of weird connecting lines here or something, I can draw a weightless line. And that's uh, that can be really useful, especially if you need like really precise thin lines in some for some reason. But, you know, so that means you don't have to have two different brushes, you know? Um, you, you can have a, like just a few different brushes and then, you know, turn this on and you can get in here and get these nice tapered strokes. And have everything look homogenous knowing that because the DPI is set so high, everything's going to gel really well together. So yeah. I went in here with my basic rounds. Um, again, I set the spacing really tight on them. Um, I don't, again, it's just, there's, I don't want to get into it in this video, but there was just something I was like, all right, um, I like the 1% spacing better than the 25% spacing, but that's just me. Maybe that's not the right way to go, but that's the way I did it. Anyway, yeah, we're in here. Um, and I went in and I just continued. And, you know, at this stage, I was like, what is this brain? Is this brain technically a form of its own or is it a detail? And I decided, I was like, you know, this is kind of a detail. It doesn't need to be as pronounced as the outlines do. And to be honest, I was really intimidated to try to get in here and do this with vector tools. It seemed overly complicated and I thought I could eliminate some of that complication with my pixel brushes. So I went in, oops, sorry, go here. Uh, and I added the brain uh, details with my 
pixel brushes, my basic round, and force pressure. And so I didn't ink this thing perfectly, you see. I, I missed the mark on some spots, but I got the, the idea uh, translated pretty well. So now all my inking is finished. Uh, I got the brain in here. I've got all the details, all the slimy little... This thing on the tongue, I want to explain. It might not be clear what is happening with this tongue, but my idea was that, like, in this creature, the cybernetic and the organic are sort of vying for control, and it's like the tongue has been... It's like it has been cyberized or whatever, or cyborgized, <laughs> but then, you know, the, the organic matter of this creature is, like, sort of bubbling out of it like the the putrid innards of this thing are sort of uh, mutating and pulsing out of the 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 seams of the the cybernetic tongue i don't know I, that was you know when when you get into the groove and you're starting to sort of the ideas are coming you just sort of let it go i i don't particularly like the way i've even drawn this tongue but i felt like it wasn't terrible so i i left it Anyway, that's what's going on with the tongue there. Okay, so the inking's finished up, and I, I made some alterations to the slime as well. That was all done with the pen tool, uh, just because I wanted really clean, uh, slimy lines. Um, yeah, so we're there now. Um, we move into the coloring phase. So right away, you probably see lots of different differences happening here we'll talk about this stuff in a minute um this stuff at the top basically what i did was i went in with the flood fill tool and just started dumping colors into this thing to sort of try and figure out what i was going to do with it i like these colors and the vibe i was going for on this one was like sort of a skeletory vibe um yeah it uh I don't know. I, you could color this thing anything, really, you know. But at the moment, I, you know, I was just sort of trying to get my head around uh, the technique I was going to have to use. Basically, the technique goes like this, guys. I turn this off for now. Come up here to the top layer, right? You've got all these ink layers. If I come up here to the top layer, I'll add another vector layer. It'll appear on top, and then I'll add a pixel layer. Here, with the Flood Fill tool, I'll just grab any color. It doesn't matter. In fact, do I have... Okay. I think I just, you know... Let's uh, let's do something I didn't do in the, the actual piece. I'll just do like an orange. It's a weird little orange. Um, let's do like a reddish orange. Like 60. Anyway, okay. So we've got our color. Um, you see, I've got all these layers with ink details on them, and there's a setting on the flood fill tool called current layer, but you can also set it to current layer and below. And what that does is it takes into account the pixels that are appearing on each of the layers below this layer, right? So quite simply, if I just select this area here, it's taking into account the pixels of the eyeball line, right? If I do this uh, part of the brain bowl right here, it's taking that all into account, okay? But what you'll notice right away is if I get in here, you'll see pixelation and sort of holes. Let's go back up here around the edges, like those sort of off-colored pixels. Well, those are gonna stay there when I move this layer down to the bottom. Those will those will remain. I'll, I'll have all these little holes in my colors and I don't want those. So what I need we need what we need to do is we need to we need to adjust the tolerance of the flood fill tool. We bring that tolerance up. If you bring it all the way up to 100, it's usually a mistake. It'll color the whole layer right? Uh, it just goes crazy. But if you bring it up to something conservative, but still high, like say 75, you get this nice fat fill. But you have to remember, oops, sorry. 
but oops you have to remember that now when we drag this thing below the inks it's great it's perfect yeah i can go in here if i wanted to and uh you know fill different colors in these areas oops oh okay so what's happening here is because this layer is down i need a new layer right and i turn this off and i can come in here and figure out what is the tolerance that i need in order to fill this little area here with blue oh and again i've made a mistake because i'm not on top of the layer right and it's set to current layer and below so now i can go in and fill in these little areas like this if i want to and see how every time i move the tolerance up i get a little more space i get a little more tightness of the fill so you got to go in and you find i bet you this one's perfect at 50 percent oops maybe that maybe not maybe that one's a bit too high anyway there you go so that's how that works um for example here if i go and select that orange color again whatever that was um it's filled in most everything there are a little there there are some spots that it doesn't catch right and you you've always got to go in and sort of find those but look at why that's happening that's happening because all those detail lines are sort of getting in the way. And now watch what happens when I turn them off. Those spaces are not colored in. But what you can do is you go in and that's part of the advantage of inking this way and all these separate layers. So I can get them out of the way when I don't need them. Right now, I want to color that skin, but I don't want the details to get in the way. So I've got this. Yeah. And I can just come in now and get that taken care of. It looks like I got my tolerance set almost perfectly. You come in, find the little areas that you um, want to get colored, the same color, and you go for it. And this, basically, when I first did this, you'll see here, if I turn this back on, you'll see that I went in and... Um, I colored almost everything on the same layer, this layer right here. And like I said, this was my first pass. I was just trying to get to see, so I was experimenting with the colors, trying to figure out what I was gonna do. I didn't really know what I was gonna do. It's not perfect, there's lots of mistakes and there's a disadvantage from coloring everything on the same layer like this. If you color things on separate layers, it's really easy to manage them individually uh, and make edits. and. That's, uh, I think, a trap that you get people... I, I used to, when I was a beginner, I would fall into that a lot. I would try to color everything on the same layer and it would become a nightmare for as far as editing was concerned. So um, as I've been working in ve vector persona a lot or designer persona, um, I'm getting used to this idea of having things separate from each other. And it's really useful. Um, the last thing I'll talk about in this phase uh, will be the uh, the color mode that I've chosen for this uh, situation with the brain and uh, also the paper overlay that you may have noticed earlier. So again, in this stage, I'm just sort of getting my concept sorted out. Um, here for the brain, um, I just colored it like a pink color, like a brain should be colored. But then I was like, okay, I want it to be discolored once the the fluids in there because i wanted to sort of show that the 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 way you know the color of the fluid would would change the coloration of the brain and that was real simple i just went in and changed this bright slimy green i changed it to overlay mode okay because i'm in rgb now i did say that i wanted to get this thing printed on a shirt later but we can always convert the document, right? And uh, if I haven't gone too crazy with my colors, um, 
I won't have much trouble converting the colors to CMYK at the end. There won't be too many discrepancies. And also, even though I'm working in RGB, I'm mixing my colors using my CMYK sliders. Now, this is not always the best way to do things. I don't, I'm, I'm not certain of that, but this is the way that I have been approaching things. I want to have access to the layer modes and stuff in RGB mode, but they don't behave the same way if the document starts in CMYK. So uh, a lot of times the, the layer modes uh, are directly linked to luminance, which is uh, how dark or light something is based on the amount of black or, or a gray or white, I guess, which is in that particular color. So while I'm going through here, I'm trying to mix my colors in CMYK. And now for this one, if you take a look at the color, there's no black in that at all. Yeah, I did it on purpose. I mixed this color in CMYK. So in, in, case, in case it came up that I needed to, I wanted to use this color. Um, and I, that's what I was kind of doing during this whole process. Some of the colors will have black, some of them won't, but for the most part, they didn't. I only uh, brought that into the equation when I needed to use layer modes, but in this situation, I only used the layer mode once, and it was in this moment here. Um, I just took that bright green color and I was like, what? I, you know, I played around with the layer modes. I was like, what happens when I do this? You know, so I just played around a little bit. Lighten could have worked. but I felt overlay was the best. So then what I did from here was I went in with my color picker tool and I started a document palette and I collected the colors that I wanted, right? I didn't end up going with the purple, but I did end up going with like this sort of chrome over here. I did go end up going with this green that was created as a result of the layer modes. I did end up going with the brain color under the water and above the water. A lot of it, a lot of this stuff stayed in place. So basically I got my ideas down on the paper really quickly and really dirtily. Uh, this happened, I don't even know how long this uh, piece took. At total time, it was probably about four or five hours total. I worked on it in little chunks over the course of a week. Like, you know, for like an hour a day, uh, you know, when I had downtime. Um, so, yeah, that's the the way that I sort of came up with the concept for my colors. Um, basically, we, we should talk about this stuff here, the, the, the texture overlay. Um, the textured overlay situation is, you know, I was trying to make this thing. I love vintage looking stuff. As you guys know, my quick hit vintage. Like, I love textures. Um, I'm addicted. Uh, it's not always conducive to making an image, but I knew that in addition to this thing getting printed on a t-shirt, yeah, it was also going to have to hit my Instagram. So I started playing with these color textures or these paper textures. Um, the way I did this was pretty simple. I basically just duplicated this texture here. Yeah. And then brought it above. As you can see here, it's it's right here. Then I started adding some adjustments. I added a black and white adjustment. Like actually, um, what if I? How do I do this? I want to show you that. I want to show you what it looks like with nothing there. Okay, I have to take it out of screen mode. It is in. Is the whole group in screen mode? Yes. So right now this whole group is in screen mode. I'm going to put it in normal mode. Okay. So I took and duplicated the paper texture and then I added a black and white adjustment. You can see how that looks here. I didn't make any edits to the, the, the adjustment mode, right? I just left it basic. And then I added a brightness contrast and 
dump the brightness all the way down to minus 100 and I jack the contrast all the way up to 100. And now all the grays and blacks and whites come out of this thing um, looking very different. There's a lot of contrast. It looks very, the texture looks like I could almost touch it. After that, I put the thing into screen mode. And then this is way too bright. You know, it's it's not what I wanted. So I just dropped it down to like 50%. And that's it. You still get those nice lines moving across. Those the straight lines that attracted me to the cardboard in the first place. And, you know, it looks beat up and old. It looks all dusty. You uh sort of get a get this really sort of vintage vibe from it. Now, I was a little bit worried that, um, I was a little, oh yeah, this is what it looks like without the, the texture overlay. So basically I duplicated this layer and you see those lines are still there, but I wanted them to be more pronounced. And also I didn't like the lightning effect. I wanted to sort of counter it, right? So I went back in and tried to get more out of it. I put a curves adjustment on it and I played with the uh, the curve on this thing uh, to try to make, to try to bring out uh, the darker parts of the paper texture. And also that would make the lighter parts of the screen mode lines even lighter in contrast. Um, so basically I did that and then I set this one to overlay mode at about 50%. It balanced out the colors. It brought them back to where they were originally were, but it left the highlight effect of the screen layer in place. So yeah, that was just me playing around with paper textures and experimenting a little bit. I wouldn't say that that's a, a, a solid technique or way of doing things. That's just what I did. Uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but yeah, that's what it is. All right, let's uh, let's continue on. We're almost done, guys. I think I'm a little bit over an hour here, but uh, I hope that you've learned stuff and I hope it's been interesting. Um, so basically, we go to here. I find the colors that I want. I've got my palette built and I start making some notes. Yeah, because I'm starting to find all this stuff that that's wrong and these mistakes. Um, I didn't color this. Uh, this line, oh, let me take it out of pixels mode. This line, I didn't adjust the taper there and I, I got carried away and I was moving too fast and I didn't edit it. And uh, that happens again right over here. The vector line, I didn't, I didn't edit the taper. Doesn't look good. I didn't color this. I just, I'm going through, I'm finding everything that's wrong with this thing before I decide to throw it up on my red bubble uh, as a t-shirt, you know? Here, I put an X on this because I was like, man, something's got to be done with that tongue color. I don't like that tongue color. It's weird, you know? Uh, so yeah, I, I'm i in here just trying to get my ideas sort of collected for the final pass. Um, what I did do though, is when I did do the coloring, I colored... Again, I, I put almost everything on the same layer on this one, which was not what I intended to do, but this is basically the moment where I'm sort of like, okay, this is what we're going to stick with. This is pretty much the end game. Um, now I've just got to go in and clean up all the mistakes before I do my final coloring pass. All right. So I just got a red pen out and started making some edits and making some notes, all right? And then from there, I go to my final pass, which was this. Changed a few of the colors. And if we look into the layer mode, or not the layer mode, but the coloring stack, you can see I, I went and I colored everything on its own layer. I had the tolerance set just right. There's not uh, many areas that, that are visible that, um, you know, have uh, like you know, 
there's not many spaces on this uh, drawing. In fact, I don't think there are any now where the colors are not uh, are showing holes, you know, behind the ink lines. So I went in and did that. I got all my colors just the way I wanted them. If you look at the brain bowl area, this is no longer using a layer mode. It is now using colors as I'm sort of getting this thing prepared to have it printed on a sticker or a t-shirt on Redbubble. Um, so yeah, I went in here, drew some sort of speculars with a, with a pencil tool uh, in a designer persona, sort of make it a little shinier. Uh, I put this specular here on the jar, but I end up taking it off for the final version because it doesn't really work. I don't think it works really well. Um, I could have like lowered the opacity or something, but it just felt distracting. I didn't, I don't know. I didn't like it. So I left it like this. Change the colors of the lips and the gums and the tongue. And then sort of, I took the layer, the, the, the overlay layers off offline just to sort of see what it looked like, you know, when it was getting ready to be printed. Okay. So here we'll move to the last step or the last phase. Clean up and finishing touches. All right, so nothing much has changed. Um, I go in, and so what I do is, firstly, I'll take this offline real quick. I'll take this offline and that, and I'll bring this back. So once I've got all my colors organized, I decide to finally group up my inks, right? And um, my colors into one little area like this. And then I wanted to get like, I don't know, I, I, I love texture, of course, I'm a texture addict. So I go in here with um, my splatter brush. Uh, that's also gonna be included in this kit, quick kit mini that I've worked up. I didn't build this kit for this drawing. This is just a kit that I've been playing with a lot. In fact, uh, if you listen to the intro in the beginning of this video, this kit uh, will be included in this download. Um, yeah, I'm trying to raise a little money for Christmas. I put this kit in here. Um, I think people will really enjoy it. I'm actually going to do a little video on this kit so you can show you some ways you can use it because I've come up with some pretty interesting little techniques that you can achieve with this little brush kit. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, I don't know. It, I'm fond of it and I thought people would really enjoy it. But um, I also uh, need to try to raise a little extra cash for the Christmas season. So I'm putting that out there. Um, yeah, uh, the splatter brush that I used on this one is included, right? It's in here. I basically went in, and uh, if you look at it, um, I used kind of a brownish color, or actually, I think I used like a, like a, yeah. But, you know, it wasn't really happening. I just went in with some layer mode, changed the layer mode, and I got that, like, sort of dirty, like, look I was after. Um, I didn't change it much for the lips. I went in here. Um, I think I may have hit this with a uh, with either the splatter brush or even the spray brush um, to get. Basically, I just wanted it to look dirty and funky. Like this guy, this guy doesn't brush, you know. And uh, once I got all that in place, basically, I go in. And I've grouped these things up. I duplicate the group. Yeah. And then I rasterize it. All right. So now it's rasterized. I relabel it final raster. Right. But then what I do is I put an outline effect on it because I really want it to pop against whatever it's being printed on. Because now I'm, I'm in t-shirt mode right now. Right. So if I take this and turn it off. Oops. Got to turn that back on. I really want it to pop when it's put on a sticker or a t-shirt. So I just gave it a tiny little outline. It's nothing, it's nothing fancy either. It's like six pixels. It's nothing too extreme. Uh, and that makes everything sort of, it kind of congeals everything. That's like, that's it. Um, I added a specular to the eye with a vector ellipse, right? Um, and then for the motion lines, what I did for that was 
I just decided that, you know, this thing is a ball and I wanted to get that motion going. And, you know, um, multiple parallel white lines is sort of comic book language for something moving quickly through the air. So that's what I put in here. Um, to create those was pretty simple. Basically, I'll just create one for you. Uh, I'll create it again really quick so you can see how it's done. I'll go back to designer persona. I'll add a vector layer and then we'll grab the pen tool. We'll load it up with a pressure curve like this. I'll put it into line mode, draw it out like this, change the color to white. No fill. And then I um, just real simple edit, something like this. Maybe a little more. Yeah, that's fine. And then maybe beef up the, the width of the stroke a little bit. Something like that. Maybe it's a little too much on the curvature there. Maybe I'll just sort of destroy this much of it. All right. And then we'll just edit that out like this. Okay, cool. So once that's in place, basically I come down here with my move tool and I basically, this is the transformation origin. If I rotate this, you see how that little uh, clock, those clock hands are moving from the center there. I can change that center and basically I change it all the way down here to the corner and it conveniently snaps down there in the corner, right? So then what I do is I duplicate this once, hold my finger down, make an adjustment. I don't have to hold my finger down, but now you see when I adjust, now you see the clock hands are down there where the transform origin is. So once that's in place, I can do this. And then if I need another line, power duplication will take over and I can duplicate it again. And it gives me the same deal as before. And then to get variation, I just go in and edit the lines, right? Something like this. Um, let's drop this part. Yeah, and then let's take this one and then let, let's drop two parts off of it, like one from the beginning and one from the end. Something like that, right? And that's basically how I created this. So then with everything together, this is the final result. The last thing I did was I, I felt that the cardboard looked too dull and I wanted this thing to be really vibrant. So I just duplicated it. Uh, I don't, I didn't even need to duplicate it. I just did. I, it's not necessary. I went in and then added a color overlay and then changed the color to yellow. And you see what's great is that the, the overlay layers are taking care of that texture beautifully. The texture is still there um, and the color is now vibrant yellow. This thing looks like, you know, it's like a cardboard box in the toy store or something like that. That's kind of what I was going for. So yeah, guys, with that being said, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this session. I know it went a little bit longer than I thought, which usually happens with me, but... Uh... All right, guys, sorry. I, 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 after I stopped recording, I realized there was an important part of this that I haven't spoken about that we're gonna talk about right now. Um, so let's get into that. Uh, exporting the file, right? I talked so much about putting this thing on a t-shirt. I want to make sure you guys, uh, especially you beginners out there that are just getting into like print on demand stuff. I want to make sure that you get at least a, a, a sort of basic understanding of, um, what you might need to do. Um, now I think I've already done it on this one. I'm going to double check, but, uh, what we need to do first is convert the document to CMYK. And remember, um, you know, I, I spent so much time getting the document ready by making sure my colors were CMYK safe that it should be a very easy and fine conversion, right? So if I come over here 
and I go to convert document. Yes, it's an RGB eight, but let's check it out. Watch this. Um, when I do finally change this over, uh, what, actually what I'm going to do is the first step is actually get rid of everything that's not going to be printed, right? Only our design will be remaining. Okay. Now what I want to do is convert this document to CMYK and then hit apply. You've saved everything. You've got everything backed up. Your snapshots are there. So your snapshots are saved in RGB. So you won't have to worry about it. If something bad happens, you just go back to your snapshot and everything will be right as rain. You hit apply and it converts to the document. And luckily I spent all that time making sure my colors were nice and CMYK safe. So it doesn't, there was no big changes to the document, right? Which is great. So then what I'm going to do is I come over here and I, I've got to take a look at what, what we're going to do. Now, if you just want to export a single uh, image, let's talk about that first. Okay. So I, I've got a white background on this document, but I want to export a transparent background PNG. The easy way uh, to do that is, oh, you know what? Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked, but I just want to explain something really quick. I also didn't talk about this. This is just a silly channel mixer adjustment that I put in place. I was trying to see what it would look like if this guy was flesh colored. Um, eh, whatever, take it or leave it. It, um, it's not working now because the document's in CMYK, but back when the document was in RGB mode, uh, it, it actually changed. I was, okay, look, here's what we're going to do just to show you how easy this is. Going to come back here, change this. We're back. No big deal. Come to the layer stack, turn this on. I was imagining what if this guy looked like, you know, what if it was like more humanoid? What if it was like one of these weird, uh, the hills have eyes mutant people? That's what I was thinking about. Anyway, whatever. Ridiculous. Anyway, okay. Now let's uh, go back to what we were doing. Again, I'm going to convert the document really quick. Oops. Sorry. CMYK. Before I hit apply, I'm turning all this stuff off. Just so we're, we're not shocked. I hit apply. It changes it. I'm okay. So now I want to export a single image. If that's what I want to do. What I'm going to have to do is I'm going to put a rectangle in here. Let's make sure that it's no stroke, no fill, completely transparent. And uh, yeah, we're good to go there. I'll take this bad boy, snap it to the edges of my artboard or my canvas or spread, whichever one you want to call it. And then I'm going to take and gather up the specular, the final raster and the motion lines and pull them all in to the rectangle so that when I select this rectangle, I've got somewhere to start that will export a, an image with a transparent background. So when I come over here to the document menu, I will hit export. I want to make sure it's a PNG. I don't want to turn on the map background. Um, what I will do is instead of the whole document, I will just do selection only, right? And um, when I do this, you see how my canvas dimensions are actually 2048 by 2048. Now, on Redbubble, the recommended size for a t-shirt is much larger. I think it's something like, um, it's at least 5,000 pixels, uh, the dimensions are. So we need to be much bigger than that. I would say um, doing like three times the size of this is about right. Like 6144 is okay. Right with this locked, you know, it constrains the, the dimensions. So that's a really big image, right? But it's great because what, what it means is the quality will remain consistent across both large and small, uh, um, sized images. So this thing is going to look as clean as it does on a big t-shirt or a poster as it will look on a coffee cup or a sticker or a notebook or something like that. So then once you've done this selection only increase the size to make it to make it quite large, right? You can either hit okay to save the file or share to choose what to do from the sharing and saving options menu over here. Yeah. Um, 
for me, sometimes, oh, and you can also get a preview of it by hitting this, right? You can sort of check out your preview, make sure it's sort of a way to proofread before you actually ex export. So that's a really useful little uh, situation that you can uh, use. Everything looks good. Uh, I can't see my black outlines well because the background is black, but that's okay. Um, I know that there's going to be no white background on this image, so I'm, I feel safe. So I hit close, and then I hit um, OK to save it. There are also other things we can do. Um, I'm going to keep this brief. I've never really talked about it in any of my other videos, but since this is primarily a design that was intended to be put on a t-shirt or a sticker, I'll tell you a little bit about Export Persona. It's really not that complicated and mystical. Um, let's open it up. I'm going to come over to Export Persona. And what you get here is this is where your slices will reside. What are slices? Well, they're parts of the image or things that you're going to that you want to export. And this is basically the whole point of this persona is to save you the trouble uh, of all the minutia that comes with exporting an image. Yeah, it allows you to get it done in bulk, which is great. So if I come back to my layer stack over here, what I can do is let's say I want to let's say I want to export the ink outlines as well as the final result of this image. Um, I can tap this and then create a slice. I can then tap this and I don't really want to create a slice of this. What I want to create is a slice of this. So I'll grab that and create another slice. So now when I come back up to my slices menu, I have the ability to, to export both the inks and the colors and inks together. So everything that I've selected in here and created a slice for, it's going to be exported, which is great. So then from here, I can rename my slices. I'll call this one this is, they're automatically called slice, right? But I can just go in here, let me turn my keyboard really quick. I'll call this uh, inks only and then hit okay. And then I'll make sure that this gets exported at three times the size and then I'll come back. So then I'll do the same thing for this. I'll, call, I'll rename this one, we'll call this slice. Um, oh, I don't know, we'll call this uh, complete. Mad ball. Okay. And then again, at three times the size, I want to export it. You can even do one at each size. Maybe you need something smaller for some reason. I don't know. You can do that. So here, after you get everything done, a lot of times the background will be selected. I just turn that off and then I just hit export all. And I've already designated a folder. Um, Yeah, I'll show you that right now. I, I, I went through this really quickly just before I decided to film this little addendum. Um, turn this on. Ooh, done. Uh, we want uh, Mad Ball for Red Bubble. And there you go. I've got an inks only. You can't see it well because the background's there, but if I go in here and I hit info, basically it's a very large... Um, it's a very large little image. It's not a perfect square, but that's okay because it's a PNG. There's no real background to it, right? It's not going to have any white printed behind it. It's just going to be the black lines. Maybe you need that. Maybe somebody needs that. And over here, if I go to complete, here, again, it's the same size as my inks, but basically it's a 5307 by 5247 and uh it's uh it's looking pretty good. Um that's about it guys. These files are perfect for printing the the, the very large ones like this. There's not going to be any white background on them. You'll be able to put them on a t-shirt really comfortably and they'll also scale down really nicely if you are looking to um if you're looking to uh, have this thing printed on a t-shirt. So, uh, yeah, that's it guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video guys. Take care of yourselves. Keep working hard. And, um, yeah, 
uh, stay warm. It's getting cold out there. We we'll, we will uh, we'll see you again real soon. Thanks for watching and uh, thanks to all you guys for uh, helping me hit 1,000 by subscribing. I really appreciate it. that's really cool. Take care of yourselves, guys. Cheers.